Hey guys, how are you? Uh, I'm your entertainment for the next uh, few minutes here. So uh, I'm going to probably, uh, I, I always find that uh, PowerPoint is the great Simon X of conferences. So I'm going to uh, talk for maybe 10 or 12 minutes and then open it up to questions. We'll see how we do. And I'm reminded that I'm on camera, so you're not going to get everything uh, I normally might say. But uh, uh, we'll talk about Curriculum Associates. So uh, we're uh, based in Massachusetts. Um, we have about 700 people now. And uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit first about, uh, about our product. So uh, uh, we're a SaaS-based company. We have um, an assessment, the, an adaptive assessment. Uh, we have about 12% of the K-8 children in the United States on our platform now. We've been experiencing a lot of growth. That assessment goes to either student-led or teacher-led instruction. Uh, those products we call iReady or uh, instruction or ready. Um, the, the goal of the, of the assessment is to break things down into their, their atomic level to, a, a, to a, a place where we can build back up to figure out just where a child is. Okay? So uh, if I asked you a question, is it better to buy a pound of coffee for $9 or 12 ounces of coffee for $7.50, since you're all investor type people and so forth, you'll figure that out right away. But that's a multi-step common core problem. And a lot of times people think it just involves the fractions. But one thing it also involves are proportional relationships, ounces to pounds, right? Could be kilometers to meters, or whatever. So we're keeping track of that all the time. And then we queue up if it's the fourth time uh, that Amara had difficulty with uh, proportional relationships, we're going to queue up content just for her and then report on that and then also see that our content is actually delivering results. So we can test that all the time. So that's a little bit about our product. Uh, key is to make it easy to use for teachers, make sure you're getting student achievement, and that it's engaging for children. Okay? So uh, that's the shortest product pitch I've ever done in my life. Okay? So uh, this is, uh, I'm hitting the green button. There we go. Uh, a little bit about our growth. So we've, uh, we've experienced a lot of growth. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, less than 40 million uh, in bookings. Uh, we have to defer revenue because of a software as a service. It's normal uh, over the life of a contract, which is a, typically a year, but can be longer occasionally. And uh, so it's really grown a lot. Um, the, uh, I think the more interesting thing is you, when you break down that growth, so the, the iReady portion, which is now uh, the majority of the company, the bookings growth for the software, it's a little hard to read here. So I'll, if I go off here, you can still get me on the camera. OK, so 88% uh, uh, growth in, in uh, compounded annual growth over the last four years. But the other thing is you know, getting it, that says 4 million. It's actually 4.4 million 112,000 as of this morning. Uh, but who's counting? So uh, the key thing for us, though, is to look at not just that uh, that's grown a ton, but uh, usage student logins. So there's a bunch of proxies of this, but student logins is, is actually 50% greater than the student growth. So what that means is that children are using it more and more engaged. Uh, that's true with, uh, with teachers and other folks. And lesson completed, uh, they're doing more. They're using it more. So we're more embedded in the district. So we're proud of, uh, proud of those statistics. Um, I already work, so this is uh, third-party research. Um, when you use one of our products, there's a bunch of different ones of this, but I, this is the lowest one, where we have a 19% a, a greater gain in reading, a 24% greater gain in math. We're big with the blended learning people, where we do multiple things, where they're buying multiple products. And uh, that, that, you know, I think one of the biggest reasons for our growth as a company is that uh, what you see on the right side, right? If you, you know, the you're talking about a a study of you know, 4,000 kids, um, a real study, uh, third party uh, reviewed, and so forth, and, and seeing real gains for kids. You always want to be careful with, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here running around um, with these charts showing gains. Uh, and there's you know, noise in all of them, including ours. Um, but there's no way you can walk away from one of those charts if you really read the research and not really fully understand that we're actually driving uh, gains for children, which is one of the reasons for our success. So uh, uh, the other thing that we focus a lot on is the number of kids. We, we, uh, we work in all sorts of districts, but we work with some large urban districts like Miami, uh, New York City, and so forth. And uh, so we need to work with uh, different populations. We estimate, we don't know for sure, that about 70% of the kids 
who use our software are on reduced and free lunch. And we want to be able to make sure that we look at subgroups to make sure they're doing well. Uh, so you can see that um, we actually are showing, when you, when you pull apart these gains, great gains for ELL kids, for special education kids, for economically disadvantaged kids, uh, uh, to make sure that, that we're doing well with those subgroups uh, in addition uh, to the overall. We've won lots of awards. Uh, that's a pretty slide. There's lots of awards in the sector. I'm not sure if it's relevant to some of my other slides. Um, and the, uh, uh, another one, I know this is a little hard to read, but I think another testament uh, to all software as a service, but in particularly in schools, which where procurement is so difficult, uh, service is difficult and so forth, is what's your renewal rate. Uh, so our um, renewal rate is, uh, is at 92%. Okay? Um, it's actually 96% for our top uh, 100 districts, where it has been our focus. Uh, we focus on all of them, but obviously, you know, when, when one school buys it in a place that's a little different, then, you know, we have every kid, uh, and, you know, we have 200,000 kids in one district. It's, it's uh, the implementation and service you provide um, is different, not because we, we want to provide less service somewhere else, it's because the district management is, is embracing the entire thing for how they manage the district with our data. So the, uh, the upsell rate, uh, uh, this roughly means... Um, that if I bought 10,000 licenses of iReady last year, that I'm going to buy 15,700 licenses this year. Okay, uh, so is uh, is very very strong. Uh, you saw the uh, the bookings. Um, you know the, the company's been around for a long time. We were actually founded in 1967, uh, 1969. We were a uh, uh, you know an old school kind of company until 2008. We're now we're an ed tech company, but we have just a little bit that 13% of some of the legacy stuff. Um, and then uh, uh, this chart is the one on the bottom right that I guaranteed will go down at some point. I don't understand it myself. But we, uh, we have a 70% win rate uh, for RFPs. So when we do a formal RFP, uh, I don't know how that lasts forever. So you should just watch that one go down at my next conference. I don't have any information that would suggest that. But just, to, you know, I don't like being that high. You can only go down. OK. Uh, a little bit about the service team. I think um, one of the things that uh, makes a difference um, in our world is I can barely keep up with all this technology, uh, and I run the place. Um, the notion that I would be a school superintendent and have to deal with Common Core, you know, uh, George Soros Tea Party, back and forth, school boards, school buses, parents, and then be the latest in technology, I think that's very, very hard. And so people need us to provide uh, excellent service and be great partners. And, and I ask all the time when I'm in a sales process for the district to think about not only about our product, which uh, they like a lot, um, but are we the right people to go on this journey with, right? Because we're going to be changing all the time, and it's only great if it gets implemented well. And I think that's where some other companies fall down. So we have a, you know, a significant service staff. Uh, we have people focused every day looking at usage of, um, of our software in every location with every teacher in every place, and, and what that allows for uh, is us to know if people are starting to falter and not using, because if we don't get usage, we don't get gains, okay? And that service component, I think, uh, is one of the things that makes us very sticky. I've had people uh, say to me, you know, there's this a guy named Mike, <laughs> uh, who was the service provider of a superintendent, and, you know, if Mike leaves, I'm leaving with him. Uh, and, you know, at first that should be scary to a CEO, but not if, you know, if you're a good employer and you treat people well. The, you know, Mike having a relationship is a competitive advantage uh, for our company, right? And you better be great at tech, you better be great at software, but you better have Mike, right? And that's how we view the world. Um, uh, a little bit about the management team. Uh, I think the first thing that's probably unusual about the management team is that uh, we like each other. Uh, the second thing is that they've uh, all been here for five years. Okay, so we've been on this journey together. Uh, you know, my experience on being on boards and so forth is that normally when a company, you know, we've almost quintupled in size in four years and has a management team, you're like, well, that person was so good back then, right? Uh, we haven't had that problem. We had people with, with deep experience. Uh, uh, you can read my bio somewhere else. Uh, Renee uh, was a McKinsey engagement manager, um, worked uh, in a, uh, creating a, a profitable division to use uh, the Museum of Natural History's content, which is, you know, you and I think about that museum. This is in New York, a little bit like 
the Smithsonian where you go to the museum, but it's also those Raiders of the Lost Ark guys digging stuff up, and then taking that content and making it uh, to bring uh, value to the museum, uh, like a for-profit business within the museum. Uh, Dave Karen was uh, the former, uh, you know, a couple owners ago, the former CFO of um, Houghton Mifflin, so uh, very experienced there, CFO of Cambium. Andy Smith had had three runs uh, as a CTO um, in private equity-backed firms, um, was about to take the uh, uh, CTO of TripAdvisor job before I went, happened to be on a ski lift with him, so we got him. Uh, Woody Pack, uh, um, actually very interesting guy, was a, uh, a teacher, very competitive guy, was on a, a football team, uh, teacher, uh, went on to business school, and then corporate executive board, and while there, uh, did a study of 5,000 uh, sales reps in 50 industries to what makes a world-class sales force. Uh, and he studied what it takes to be a world-class sales force and put his teaching and uh, research together and became a great leader for us. Katie Nicholson is someone I've known uh, who has been at Bain and Jumpstart, worked for me uh, a couple different times and uh, runs our product. So won some awards there um, uh, that are fancy. Um, but you know about words, you know we all have awards. Okay, so uh, this I actually care about quite a bit. Um, my view of, uh, of our industry is um, you have to do uh, a couple big things really well, but you have to do hundreds of little things very well. There's a bunch of tiny little levers. Um, getting to the last mile in school and creating change uh, requires uh, uh, a great group of people. Uh, I am the most obsessed executive you've ever met in your life. Uh, about talent. Uh, I continue to interview everyone who ever comes to the company, including the summer interns. Last year, I interviewed 371 people. Um, uh, those were the finalists. We only hire one in nine that we interview in our company. We have many more applicants. Uh, the average person uh, meets eight people uh, in our process. It's a very, very deliberate process. Uh, the, I think the way to win in our industry is, uh, is to have world-class talent and a great culture uh, of grace for that talent. And uh, that has led us to you know, winning company culture awards, being uh, Boston Globe's top places to work, uh, a ton of other places. And uh, uh, the CA story uh, is really this story. It's the story of, of just truly outstanding people, um, again and again, doing remarkable little things uh, that are very tough to compete against uh, if you do hundreds of times. So. Uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, different things, uh, you know, very mission-oriented place. Uh, we, we launched a, uh, a $15 uh, minimum wage, things that, you know, probably a little less interesting but, uh, uh, to you, but uh, I helped uh, found the, uh, the Boston chapter of Conscious Capitalism. This was uh, a group founded by um, uh, the CEO of, uh, of uh, Costco and the CEO of Whole Foods. Uh, to try to create uh, conscious leadership in America, so I'm, I'm involved with that both uh, in Boston and nationally. Um, and I'm not going to show you the appendix because I don't even know what it says. Okay, so uh, that's it. That was 11 minutes and 15 seconds, the fastest you've seen today. And I will open it up to any question in the world. If you got it. Yes, sir. Well, well, gosh, that was a fantastic presentation. I guess maybe the question some of us should ask and tell, is... Tell me who you are. Sure. Uh, John Horton, Water Street Capital. Yeah. Um, I guess the question maybe some of us should ask who uh, probably are not as good at interviewing and hiring talent as you are. Do you have any great tips for us? Uh, I do, but I need your capital first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I think the... the um, you know, I, yes, I have a bunch of tricks to the trade that we won't go into today, but I, I think the, the thing to do has to do with where your head is. Um, so the most exciting thing for me, the thing that most motivates me is to get an outstanding recruit. So if I have a choice going into work, whether to get a million dollar order or get a world class recruit, I head to the recruit. And, um, and then the company knows that I'm crazy about that. And, uh, and it just starts to feed itself. It's not just Rob. But, and then I attract people who are also crazy about that. And, um, 
and if, if you care most about it, I, you know, one of, the thing, one of the most interesting things I've ever read was a study uh, done at Harvard Business School about what makes a happy employee, and 70% is whether they're a happy person, right? And you're like, oh, hire happy people, have a happy workforce, right? Uh, another person once said to me, uh, this is ages ago, back when I worked with uh, Deborah Von Upson, um, it's easier to be an outstanding recruiter and an average manager than an average recruiter and an outstanding manager. And, and when I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, that's so true. It's just, if, if I can, I should, just, so when I think about spending my time, over 50% of my time is on talent related issues, basically getting great people and making sure they get along. Um, I can't think of a better thing to do. And that's where it comes from. There's no, it's, it's just caring more about it than anything else. Other questions? Uh, Tom, I'm here with Capstone. Um, Hi, Tom. How are how you? you doing? I'm great. Uh, how integrated are your, is your sales group as well as your service teams that are out locally in the field? Yeah, so uh, we need to change the name, but it's called the Three-Legged Stool. Uh, and uh, we have a person in sales, a person um, in professional development, and actually a, and a, a person called an account manager that name's used sometimes for sales in our industry. But um, so the professional development person is, is giving a presentation in schools all the time, but you know, in their car a lot, traveling a lot. The account manager sits at home and is thinking about the usage and the gains and like, you, you don't call the help desk at CA, you can in an emergency, but you call Kate and you know her cell phone number. Uh, that's your account manager and they're, they're like the director. Uh, and the, uh, the salesperson is doing all the things that you would expect for sales and we that, that salesperson is also responsible for renewal, but that group uh, typically meets every week. Um, they can talk about all accounts or problem accounts, and they're just very focused on, uh, on getting all those things right. So we, we find that great service is great for sales, and um, uh, it also is great for product development because those service people are yelling at the PD people to get this little thing, that little thing right, uh, and, and that's, that's worked really well for us. Uh. What's your outlook um, for the future of the uh, basil business in K-12, given all the incredible stuff companies like yours are doing in terms of, um, I guess I'd almost call it supplemental. Is supplemental taking share from basil over the long term, or is it two separate categories still? Thank you. Yeah, I don't, um, I, you know, I know those terms uh, exist, and that's been true historically, and there's still some of that, but uh, my experience um, is there are, uh, pots of money that are available for solutions to get kids gains. And uh, there's lots of different pots of money. You just talked about a pot of money. Um, there are people who took um, our products and made a basil for some of you, if you don't know, is it's the, it's the core program. So, you know, at first with iReady and Ready, the people would say, well, for my kids who are going behind, I'm going to buy those products, right? And then People are like, well, I may give it to every kid, but don't tell anyone. And then what started happening is like, you know what? That textbook series that I bought all year for my math program, I'm going to, I'm actually going to use your products instead. Okay? So to me, uh, you know, at first when I was approached by this, I was with a salesperson. And I'm like, I don't do that whole core adoption thing. I'm just staying out of that business. And he said, well, you're telling me I can't take these products, put them together and not change them and sell them? Is that what you're saying to me? I thought, well, maybe I won't say that. So uh, then, you know, we kind of entered that, but we didn't do anything differently. We just are, that's how it's used, right? So I think that's going to happen a ton where this, these words about supplemental and adoption or whatever are collapsing, and people just want solutions that are great. If you offer a solution that was great, one of the things that's really different about our solution than maybe a, another solution is, you know, there were 80 versions of iReady last year in 2016, right, updates. Customers probably understood about 10 of them. There were other things we're doing, fancy things to make it go faster and stuff behind the scenes. It's so nice to subscribe rather than buy, right? Because a subscription allows you to get constant updates, and if the state does something or whatever, we're going to have to do something to keep you. Subscribing is great. When you buy something that's one thing and you're supposed to keep for five years, I just, that's an outdated model that doesn't serve schools well. So um, if people have a pot of money that they call adoption or they have core to, to buy our solutions, we're all for it. We can support it with PD and so forth, but it's, it's just us being us. 
um, in our sweet spot without uh, you know, doing all the crazy things that happen with the traditional companies. Yes, sir. One last question. Uh, I just wrote my last check of tuition to Iowa State. I did. Uh, my you should have talked to me. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I, sh I should have. Yeah. My daughter graduated there, but could you tell us a little bit about your guys' relationship with Iowa State? Yeah, so um, uh, I took over for a man who is, uh, who is now 90. So I came in uh, 2008, and um, we agreed to do things a little differently. And, and um, one of the things he wanted to do um, was to be very benevolent, and he didn't uh, need any more money in his life and so forth. So um, I own a minority of the company. Uh, the majority of the company was owned by Frank, and uh, what we did together uh, is we, we gave his shares away to Iowa State uh, and a little bit to the Boston Foundation to bring money back to Boston. And um, uh, so we are 70% uh, uh, owned by Iowa State, but they don't have a board seat and they don't have voting rights and that kind of thing. Um, and it's a, you know, it was a way for us to give back. I just released you out of three minutes of useless talk. You guys have a great day.